Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Brianne Roth. I am the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Nantucket Historical Association. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our last Food for Thought for 2017. Um, we will be starting these back up um, in February, so we hope to see you back out here next year. Um, before we get things started, I'd like to take a moment to ask everyone to please make sure your cell phones are on silent um, so we do not disrupt today's lecture. Our Food for Thought series is brought to you by the MS Worthington Foundation and media sponsorship is generously, generously provided by Novation Media. Today's lecture features the NHA's project costume and textile specialist, Jennifer Neeling. Neeling first came to the NHA as an intern in the summer of 2015 and has been in her current position since January of this year. She is an MA in fashion and textile studies, um, history theory museum, pr museum practice from the Fashion Institute of Technology and has worked in several museum and costume collections, including the Fox Historic Costume Collection and Drexel University and the Chemical Fer Heritage Foundation. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jennifer Neeling. Thank you, Bree, for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, and thank you all for coming out today on this rainy day. Um, so as Brie mentioned, I did first come to the NHA as a summer intern in 2015. Um, and lucky for me, I was right out of school and saw this listing that our curator Michael Harrison had posted specifically for a costume and textiles intern. So I came and just started going through boxes of clothes. Um, and you can see from these images that this collection was um, recognized as one that really needed more attention. So if you compare it to everything else that we have in our storage, you know, we have paintings that we can pull out on racks, we have uh, the scrimshaw all nicely organized, you can see what we have, um, and then we have these boxes full of clothes. Um, so, you know, the NHA has been collecting since 1895. Um, over 100 years, and since that time, the costume and textiles collection has been moved to our various museums as the NHA has expanded um, to some of our different sites like Hadwin House, um, and it didn't all make it into the digital database when everything went digital. So we really um, didn't have a great handle on what we have in this collection, and uh, for that reason, the NHA applied for a grant so we received an IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services, collection stewardship grant. And the three main goals of this grant were to inventory and examine the entire costume and textile collection. So this means inventorying, recataloging, photographing, assessing the condition of these objects to make sure that everything's accurately described and that we can locate it. Um, to rehouse the costume and textile collection. So making sure that everything is safely stored and is going to be, oops, going to be available for years to come. Um, and then finally, to expand public access to the costume and textile collection. So we want to know what we have, and then we want to be able to use it. And part of this is through making all of our records available through our online database, database which they are, so you can look at all of them online and also by using the costume and textiles more in exhibition and programming at the NHA. So today I thought I would tell you um, a little bit about what goes into this project, and of course I'll show you some of the highlights of this collection, many of which haven't really um, been seen before by the public. So as part of the grant, we also received brand new compact storage, which makes a huge difference. You can see the drastic before and after, you know, before, Sometimes um, we couldn't really reach the boxes on the top shelf. We had to ask our collections manager, Tony, to <laughs> get up on the ladder since he's the tallest. Um, and now we have this lovely new storage with a combination of shelves as well as drawers and trays to really make things um, more accessible and be able to use our space more efficiently. Oops, sorry, it's like trigger happy on this computer. Um, another part of the grant was receiving funding to host two interns. So we had one in the spring, Meg Pearson, and this fall, Ariana Bishop. It's her last week, sadly, with us today. She's doing a wonderful job. Um, and I was also lucky to have a couple of volunteers help out. Um, former museum curator Robin Campbell was here for a month in June. And I also have to thank um, Patricia Anathan, who's one of our board members, and Elizabeth Gilbert, who works at the museum as well, for helping me out on this project. 
So what does this actually involve? First, you open a box. The label on the box doesn't necessarily reflect what's actually in it. <laughs> um, we look for a number. So everything in the museum collection has an accession number that is connected to a record. So we're looking for its records, and then we want to make sure it's thoroughly documented. What is it? What condition is it in? What else do we know about it? And then we want to be able to find it again. So making sure the location is tracked. And then finally, um, putting everything in nice archival storage. So what is it? Um, this involves uh, figuring out if there's a specific name for something, so using the correct terminology. For example, on the left here, um, there are a couple of printed cotton pelerines, which is a small little capelet um, typical of the 1830s that would have been worn with a matching dress. Um, we're looking to date things accurately, so recognizing that um, this bodice is from the 1860 because it has a particular style of sleeve that was common at that time, known as a pagoda sleeve. Um, we're looking at accurately identifying as something knitted or crocheted or maybe tatted, which in our records were often mixed up, so taking a close look at that. Um, looking at, you know, maybe we, we can tell what embroidery stitch this is. Um, recognizing what fiber something is made out of, so cotton, silk, linen, wool, and what weave it is. So I like to remind people, wool, or excuse me, silk and satin are two different things. One is a fiber and one is a weave. So is something satin weave? Is it a twill weave? And what is the condition of these things? We want to make notes so that we can recognize if it's something we need to take action on to better preserve. So sometimes the what is it is not as straightforward. <laughs> um, so this is one of our mystery objects that when I came across it in the collection, it was cataloged as a sleeve. I thought, well, I know that in the 19th century there were times when there were detachable sleeves or under sleeves, but they didn't really look like this. Um, so with a little bit of research, I figured out this is actually an undergarment. <laughs> um, so this is called a pantalette. It would be from around 1825 or 1830, and unfortunately we only have one. Um, but it would have been tied around the waist. Um, and this was, you know, the open crotch underwear was pretty typical of the 19th century. It was a lot more practical when you're wearing heavy skirts over it. Um, so, you know, mystery solved. It's a pantalette. Uh, um, so we also want to know what the story is behind this object. So where did it come from? Who donated it? Do we know anything about the people connected to this object? Who used it? Who made it? Who wore it? Um, and there are all sorts of different places to look for this information. So we're basically doing some detective work, trying to compile all the information we have from various paper sources, usually, all into our online database. So we're looking at our old accession books, um, which were written out starting in 1895. So those are kind of cool to look at since they're really a historic object in and of themselves. Um, sometimes in the history of the NHA, things were moved from one site to another and then renumbered and relisted so we can look at more than one book from different places trying to figure out, okay, is this petticoat the same one that was donated at this date? Um, we're looking at catalog cards. We're looking at flat files, and you know sometimes all we really have to go on is a number, and it says you know dress. Okay, so we've accounted for this dress. Sometimes we have a name associated with it, which we can follow up on um, in our Barney genealogical database. So figuring out the life dates of this person that can help us accurately date the object. And sometimes we get lucky and we have a folder filled with all sorts of wonderful information, like letters from the family. Um, there was this whole Massachusetts quilt documentation project that was done that actually ended um, with a lot of our quilts being put online in the Quilt Index website so they can be compared to quilts from all over the country. Um, so that is a lot of fun, kind of solving, solving all of those mysteries. And then finally, the last step is storing things. So here, um, you can see Ariana and I uh, preparing a silk shawl to be put away. So we're straightening out all of the fringe. Um, we're going to envelop that in archival tissue paper to make sure that it doesn't move around. 
um, patting out the knots so they're not going to indent the silk when it's rolled. And then um, we like to roll flat textiles because one of the main goals is to minimize any folding. So we're patting things out, we're rolling things up, and using um, all sorts of archival materials. So this is not the tissue paper you're going to use for gift wrapping. This is specifically acid-free, um, things that aren't going to have any chemical reactions or contribute to the degradation of these objects. So we have this brand new, lovely um, rolled storage so that we're not setting the rolls down and putting pressure on the object. Um, we're padding out dresses and all sorts of garments um, with various types of tissue. Um, we've made these tubes filled with batting to give a little bit more support that are covered with an archival material that's much more smooth so it's not going to snag on anything. And we actually had the whole staff um, help us out to make those tubes that you see in the middle, so that was fun. Um, some of the smaller pieces, especially the accessories, were creating custom mounts. The idea being that we're minimizing handling. So if anyone wanted to view this for research or we wanted to take a look at it to decide whether or not we want to exhibit it, we don't actually have to touch these things to be able to take a look at them. Um, and Ariana did a lovely job with our shoe drawer recently, getting those all padded so that they're not going to become distorted over time. So, so far in this project, since the end of January, we have gotten through about a thousand objects, and that's most of our collection. We still have a little bit left to do, but I've seen um, most of it, and so far I can tell you we have a wide range of men's, women's, and children's clothing, mostly from the 19th century, with a handful from the 18th century, and some from the 20th. Um, we have the underwear, outerwear, accessories, as well as um, quilts, coverlets, blankets, rugs, um, all sorts of textiles, some you know, wall hangings. So I'll just give you some examples of, of what we actually have in our collection and some of the stories that they can tell us and the themes that they can represent. So of course I have corsets in my title. Um, so I have to talk about corsets. We don't have a huge collection of corsets, but we do have a nice range um, of dates. And these can tell us, of course, the change in silhouette and in fashion throughout time, but also um, changes in technology and the materials used, industries, the resources that were available. So the 18th century stays on the left, have this more conical shape, typical of that time. And these have baleen stays on the inside. Um, so from Wales, very Nantucket. Um, and then into the 1860s, we see the shape change, still baleen stays, and even though the condition's not great on this piece, it actually really helps us get an inside look at how these things are constructed. You can see the piece of baleen is popping out of its casing, um, so we get to actually see what the stay looked like. And then into the late 19th century, we um, have a corset that does have a, um, a copyright date and uh, has steel stays. So we see a change in materials as steel was being developed and they were able to make it thinner um, and that was more available to people. So some of the other undergarments are not quite as glamorous as corsets, <laughs> um, but are interesting in that um, more, some of the more practical objects like these don't often survive because they're, they're used until they're worn out. Um, so we are lucky to have um, a lot of things that really give us a more holistic view of, of what was worn during the 19th century. Um, we have a whole bunch of drawers. So these would have been later than the pantalette that we saw earlier, but the same idea. This is a woman's undergarment. Um, men had fairly similar ones during certain times in the 19th century that would have been longer. Um, and I like to refer to our drawers drawers <laughs> because now we have a couple of drawers filled with these. Um, and many of them actually belonged to the same person, Nanny Wood, who was the daughter of Captain Albert Wood, a whaling captain. And we actually have a very large collection of clothing that is said to have belonged to that family specifically that includes all sorts of underwear, um, his undershirts with his initials embroidered on them. Um, so it really gives us an idea of what a family would have owned at that time and how many things they would have had based on their social level. So that's a really interesting collection that I'm actually still working on. 
one of the stars of the collection is our, our quilted petticoats. So we like to joke that we also have a petticoat row back in storage at the NHA. Um, and we have examples from both the 18th and mid 19th centuries, um, all hand quilted. So this is really an incredible example of craftsmanship. You can see those designs. Every tiny stitch would have been done by hand. Um, so some are quite elaborate. The 18th century ones would have been worn over open skirts, so you would actually see them. And then in the 19th century, they're really more of a, a warm piece to wear underneath your clothing in the wintertime. And um, there isn't a huge difference between the construction um, of those two eras, but one of the clues that we can look at is the, the actual fabrics used. So the, the uh, printed cotton lining in the middle there, we can tell is definitely 19th century because the printing technology had changed. So we have um, many dresses that span from about the 1830s through about the 1910s. Um, this is one of my favorites, a wedding dress worn by Rebecca Bunker, who grew up on Nantucket and then actually left the island to get married. Um, so some of the dresses we have, we do know who wore them. We have a great story behind them, like this one, um, which also has just some really incredible details of um, construction from that time. And then other pieces, we don't necessarily know who wore them, but they're a great example of the clothing of their time. So for example, uh, the 1840s, this V-shaped um, waistline was very popular. And we can also tell that this would have been worn for evening because it's short-sleeved and has a sheer neckline. Um, into the 1850s, so this one you have to imagine with the giant crinoline underneath. So if this were ever mounted for exhibition, we would absolutely put that undergarment underneath it so that it would have the accurate look for that time. Um, and some of my favorite details are, are the lovely buttons, which would have been um, made by hand by wrapping silk threads. Uh, had to show another wedding dress, because they're some of the most spectacular. Um, and you can see this one is white. The one from the 1830s was gold. So by this time, the white wedding dress really had caught on as something that was um, standard versus earlier, it would have just been a very fancy dress of any color. And even at this time, not everyone was wearing white. Um, so this was worn by Amelia Sanford of the family of Sanford Farm. We have a couple of examples of dresses with bustles, which I was very excited to see. Just, it's fascinating to see the inner construction of some of these pieces. So you see the front of the dress on the left, and then on the, in the middle here, um, at the top, this is the skirt with all of its draping, um, but then you lift that piece over, and you can see that there are actually a couple of half hoops inside the piece that were then tied to create this half circle shape at the back of the dress. So when you see a dress like this in a box, you know, at first, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around what this is actually supposed to look at. But if you look at this fashion plate here, um, you really get a sense of what was going on with this construction and, and what it would have looked like when it was on a body. Into the 1890s, there's lots of black, lots of jet beading. 1900s, we have a much more sleek, elegant silhouette. Um, and we do know who wore this dress um, on Nantucket, Isabel, Isabel Joy Riddell. We have a pretty good sized collection of menswear as well. So just a few highlights. Um, we have many silk waistcoats, a lot of them worn for weddings, and a lot of them we do know um, who wore them, including this tiny one that was worn by a five-year-old William H. Coffin, which is very sweet. Um, sometimes you get surprises. So this tailcoat at the top um, was worn at a wedding um, by the groom, but then it was also worn to a concert at the Academy of Music because I found a program in the pocket for this concert. So if you're ever dealing with historic clothing, always check the pockets because you, you never know what you might find in there. Um, and that also helped us date when, when this coat was from because we could figure out based on the conductor. Unfortunately, 
the program did not actually have a year on it. So also, if you're ever planning events, put the year on the program. <laughs> um, but we were able to figure out from who the director of the orchestra was around what time this, this jacket would have been worn. Um, we have a very large collection of children's wear. So after getting through all of the boxes, we are able to transfer them into trays, make it a lot more space efficient. And this entire column of trays in our new compact storage is filled with baby clothes. I like to call this baby land. Just, you know, find another baby dress, stick it in baby land. Um, and we have a, a large number of baby gowns. Um, many of them had been labeled as christening gowns, but it's important to recognize uh, that not all long baby gowns were christening gowns. In the uh, 18th and 19th century, it was typical to dress infants in long gowns just on a daily basis. Um, so they may have been worn for christening, especially if they're particularly fancy, um, but not necessarily. Um, some of these baby gowns, we know who wore them. Some of them we don't. Um, we do have a nice little collection of baby clothes that were worn by William H. Barney, who lived at the Hadwin House when he was young. Um, one of the highlights of the children's wear is this collection of clothes worn by Mary Palmer Nye. And this is just a handful of the things. We have several more um, dresses and baby shirts worn by her. And she's interesting because she actually grew up with her parents aboard whaling ships. And the NHA has her mother's journal in our archives. Um, so there's a lot more research to be done uh, into her story, but we can tell that a lot of these pieces, we are absolutely sure that they were worn by her because they actually have her name written into some of those undergarments. Um, and on the, the bottom left, I thought it was kind of clever. This is a little crocheted bib. So it has arm straps so that the bib will stay on. I thought that was pretty ingenious. <laughs> So to go along with all the fashionable clothing, of course, we need the accessories. So we have top hats um, for men, as well as canes and some neckwear. Um, tons and tons of bonnets, which my intern Meg in the spring cataloged for us, um, ranging throughout the 19th century from Quaker bonnets to sun bonnets to fancy wedding bonnets, and then the caps that would have often been worn underneath those. Um, we have a range of shoes and boots that Ariana cataloged for us. Um, one of my favorite collections of accessories is the fans. Um, so back when I was an intern, we took a little excursion up to the attic of Hadwin House and found a box of fans. And turns out um, they had been donated in 1968 and the donor wanted them uh, displayed at Hadwin House, which they were, and then they just stayed there. Um, there was one catalog record for this collection, 72 hand fans. Turns out it was 81. <laughs> um, and now these are all photographed and on our database, but they're all from this one collector, and it's really an interesting story just in terms of um, the idea of collecting and an, ind an individual who was from Nantucket taking an interest in one specific type of object. And uh, Catherine Cole Folger just kind of accidentally started collecting fans, and people started giving her fans. And she ended up with this huge collection that she donated to us that includes um, fans from all, the, all over the world, so China, Japan. Um, one of my favorites is uh, this one on top. It's from Java. It's made of water buffalo horn and vellum. We actually have a pair of those. Um, some of them are from France. We have the fancy mother of pearl. Um, we have a little tiny doll fan. <laughs> I think everything in our collection has a doll-sized counterpart. So we have all sorts of, of doll clothing as well. Um, and then the pink fan on the left has a little uh, pencil attached to it. And this is actually a dance card fan. So the names of all of your dance partners were written on there. Uh, it has a little bit of a word play on there as well where they've done some mixing around of letters. So these objects can tell all sorts of stories. And I think the idea of fashion itself shouldn't be overlooked, um, this idea of changing styles over time. And people all over, including on our little island of Nantucket, were very aware of these changing styles and wanted to be in the latest fashion. So this dress um, is actually still on display upstairs. So if you haven't seen it, um, 
go upstairs and check out the Pinkham exhibition. But this, we refer to as the homecoming dress worn by Melvina Marshall because she had been out on a whaling ship with her husband for a number of years. And when she came back, she asked her sister to bring her a dress in the latest fashion that she could um, disembark in. And I think this, this shows that she recognized that what she'd been wearing three to five years ago was no longer in fashion when she came back. She also probably didn't have very many clean clothes left after being on a whaling ship for that long. Um, but you know, this was really something that people were conscious of, um, including young girls. This piece is, is just fascinating. This is a, a small dress, so it definitely would have been for an adolescent girl, you know, young woman. And we have these thick bust pads sewn in. I believe it's wool. So she's trying to give herself a little bit more of a womanly figure as she's getting older. Um, so, you know, kind of a 19th century training bra. She couldn't wait to look, look like a woman. Um, so I think that's just, it's really interesting to see something like that. Um, we also see um, this idea of reusing dresses, remaking them. You know, fashion was changing constantly, but it didn't mean that you had to buy something new. You could just um, restyle something that you had. So this is an example of a dress that the waistband has been taken apart. And we know that it was complete at one point, because if you look closely, you can see the folds from where it was cartridge pleated, which is a form of gathering with really tiny pleats. Um, so they probably took out the waistband to either resize it to fit someone else, maybe they got bigger, or to redistribute the, the volume of the skirt as fashions were changing. So we see all sorts of evidence of alterations in these pieces that are really interesting. Um, there are also practical concerns to think about, so keeping warm. This little capelet is made of this beautiful, very warm, very soft seal fur. Um, I wish I could reflect it better in an image because it, it's just incredible in person. Um, and then we have this cape that's actually made out of a shawl. So uh, in the, about the 1830s to the 1850s, these imported sh Chinese shawls with very long fringe were very popular. Um, of course, silk is not cheap. So this probably would have been in the later 19th century, they're taking this old shawl and reworking it into something that was more fashionable for the time. So they've added on these really heavy tassels. They've just basically folded the, the shawl in half and gathered it at the top to make this lovely kind of evening cape look. So this idea of reusing things, and maybe it was out of thrift, maybe it was just out of not wanting to waste um, good expensive fabric. There is this idea of community and identity, whether it's personal identity or identifying um, within a group. So of course, you know, on Nantucket, the famous example is, is Quaker wear. Um, so whether it's identifying with a certain religion um, or just who you're socializing with, um, becoming, you know, being a part of a club. So the Boy Scouts, um, the War Frats Club. Uh, this embroidered tablecloth um, was was found in a house in Sconset, the House of Lords. Um, and it was made by sisters who lived there who had all their friends who came to visit them in Sconset sign this tablecloth. And they have all sorts of little doodles with the schools they went to and just kind of fun little whimsical images. And then they were embroidered over the pen or pencil. Um, so these are really, really fun to get this idea of, you know, these people socializing together and, and wanting to commemorate that. So another large portion of our collection is uh, quilts and coverlets. And at this point, I think we have about 75 quilts and coverlets. We've been through um, almost all of them, and they're in the process of being rolled and rehoused. Um, so some highlights. We have one from a very famous maker. We do have um, a quilt that was made by Lucretia Mott in 1833, and it has the date embroidered in at the top. It's made out of all silks. Um, and this T-shaped quilt would have been for four post beds. So those little ties at the corner were to tie around the bed posts. Um, sometimes we don't know who made it, but we have some really interesting surprises. So this is the top of a quilt um, that has all sorts of textiles from the earlier 19th century. So 
a lot of the stories these quilts can tell us are about changing technologies, um, different printing techniques, different dyes, um, the different ways of sewing them together. We can see that they were using different qualities of, of white patches, because they're slightly different shades. Um, lots of use of indigo. So the top is interesting. And then the back is this incredible surprise. Um, all of these fabrics from the 18th century, including in the middle, an Indian palampore, which was a textile um, that was made in India, often for export, uh, traditionally used as a bed covering, but then as it became kind of a, a sign of, of status and wealth, it was used as wall hangings and, as well. And this would have been made with a combination of block printing and hand painting of this design. And we have a, a typical um, tree of life motif at the middle with some not so typical little ships, which are really fascinating to see, um, as well as some um, printed fabrics around, which are also 18th century. So we can, we can see this, this idea of changing technologies um, from the copper prints, which were uh, invented in the 18th century, um, allowing a lot more detail than block prints. Um, the one on the right here is block printed, probably also in India, so we can trace this change in, in how they were making their fabrics. And this piece, again, is this idea of reuse. So this may have actually been a palampore to begin with, and I know that it was quilted and then cut up and sewn together because of the direction of the stitches on the quilting. We have all sorts of crazy quilts. So this late 19th century um, quilt style where they're taking all sorts of different shapes of fabric and sewing them together with Fancy stitches, um, they're almost always silk because at this point, silk was really accessible. It was a lot cheaper than it had been. Um, unfortunately, it was also cheaply made, so it doesn't always um, last in the best condition just because of the types of dyes that they were using happened to degrade the fibers. But you know, looking at all of these little details, you can imagine how much fun they would have had um, embroidering and appliquing their quilts with all of these fun, fun designs. We also have some political stories that can be told through our textiles. So this is an incredible quilt um, that is made from a fabric that supposedly was smuggled through a blockade during the War of 1812. Um, so Nantucket had claimed their neutrality in the war um, and made, had an agreement with the British naval officers and were able to, to get this um, to Nantucket when the rest of the country wouldn't have been able to. And, uh, the, the actual technology of the fabric making can help us um, confirm this story because this was a, um, a copper plate or roller printed textile that wouldn't have actually been produced in the United States, so it most certainly came from Europe, most likely England, um, and it was also made using natural dyes, which would have been used at that time. So those, those um, line up with the, family, the story of family history. Um, and it also is an, a testament to um, how much people valued fabric. You know, this, the maker, Phoebe Starbuck, wanted this fabric so badly, she was willing to have it smuggled in. And then the family clearly recognized its value as well because it survived for this many years in absolutely beautiful condition. Um, it still even has the glazing on the top of the fabric. So these ideas of trade and things coming from abroad also includes Paris. Now, as I mentioned before, Nantucketers were certainly aware of what was going on in fashion, and all throughout the 19th century, Paris was the capital of fashion. Um, so the little girl's dress was a gift um, from aunt to niece, um, the aunt being from Nantucket, uh, that she, and she had purchased it in Paris. And then these bodices on the right were found with a note that says, silk dresses from Pa that he brought from Paris, August 1833. So that is the things that we as museum people live for. We know exactly what it's from, we know where it was from. Um, and the gold bodice was also accompanied by a folded piece of fabric that I thought at first probably scrap. Oftentimes, things brought from abroad would have some extra in case they needed to do some alterations. But when I unfolded it, it turned out it was actually the skirt of the dress um, that had the waistband taken out and just needed to be um, fit to someone to be finished. 
We also have a number of things made on Nantucket, um, one of the earliest being the pieces from the Silk Company, which you can learn more about. Um, we have a few of our silk objects in Out of the Box upstairs that you can still see on display. And we have this spectacular uh, silk apron that was made um, by silk that was actually produced on Nantucket as well. So despite its condition issues, it's, it's really an incredible piece for us to have um, from the 1830s to early 40s. Um, this braided rug was made by a seamstress on the island who had been widowed and was working, doing alterations and sewing to support herself, and she kept all the scraps from the alterations she did and made uh, rugs out of the different dress fabrics that she had. Of course, Nantucket looms is represented in the collection. Um, you know, big part of this craft revival in the 60s and 70s. And there are a number of other island companies from the 20th century. Um, I love these little play sets from Nan of Nantucket that have hand painting and applique. And I haven't been able to find much information about this company, so if anyone knows anything about Nan of Nantucket, please get in touch with me, because we're trying to learn more about it. Um, we have a good number of little girls' dresses from Nantucket Designs for Children that um, Pat Anathan actually donated to us that her daughters wore. And some of them have the original tags saying exactly who sewed them. So that's pretty spectacular. Um, I also discovered with a little bit of research that Nantucket Designs for Children expanded beyond the island and actually had a deal with Butterick sewing patterns and came out with Butterick Nantucket Designs for Children patterns back in the 80s. So the goal of this project really comes down to making these things more available, more accessible, using them more. Um, and I'm happy to say that so far, we actually have been able to improve access and kind of give people a little bit more of a view into what we have. So over the summer, we did a behind-the-scenes textiles tour at Greater Light. Um, so we are still in the process of catalog cataloging all of their textiles. We have a much better handle now of what what the collection actually um, has in it. We've been through every box and seen every piece, wide range of things from all over the world. And we've been able to put some of our costume and textiles on exhibit. Um, so this dressing gown that is now upstairs and out of the box, um, I found a record for in our database, knowing that you know, Helen Marshall was a significant island person. She's actually the daughter of Melvina Marshall, who wore that homecoming dress that we also have on display. And I was able to, early on before we got the compact storage, I was able to figure out that this was in a box on the very top shelf in a stack of about five boxes that we had Tony come and help us get down. Um, and it hadn't been photographed in the database. You know, we didn't really know what to expect, and it turned out it was this incre incredible piece um, that now we can share with all of you. So that's, you know, that's really what it's all about, is, is kind of uncovering these things. And I also just wanted to show what goes into what is underneath the dress to make it um, really come alive. A whole bustle in there. Uh, <laughs> um, the wedding dress upstairs and out of the box is another highlight. So again, if you haven't been upstairs, this exhibition actually has been extended a little bit longer, so you still have a chance to see these objects on display. And we've been welcoming uh, researchers. So recently we had uh, actually an Australian um, quilt researcher come to visit and was very excited to see some of the earlier quilts that we have that are just now being, uh, being made accessible. Um, we also had a woman come to research the use of baleen in fashion. So I felt really great that you know, it hadn't been a waste of time to do these detailed descriptions of exactly which corsets and bodices had baleen stays. So you know, um, we can learn a lot, a lot more about industry and, and the use of different whale products from these things. And then finally, um, of course, we have everything available on our digital database. So if you're interested in seeing more of the objects, um, please just go to nha.org and you can search our collections, see the images, the donors, all the descriptive information. 
Um, and we've also been sharing some of the highlights on Instagram as well. If you're on Instagram, follow us. Um, you'll see some little behind the scenes tidbits. Um, so we're really looking forward to showing more through exhibitions, through programming. Um, we're planning on a costume exhibition in the next couple of years, so keep your eyes out for what's coming next. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who made this project possible. First of all, of course, IMLS, um, our curator Michael Harrison for bringing me here, Tony Dimitru, who's been very supportive, as well as all of my interns and volunteers. It's been quite the project, and it's great to see it. Um, you know, coming to fruition. So, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, if anyone has a question, we have some time for a short Q and A. So, if you have any questions for Jennifer, I can come over to you with the microphone. Ooh, you have one right here. <laughs> the amount of stuff. <laughs> um, you know, it was challenging to, to approach, you know, what, what to start with, um, keep it moving, and also just figuring out, you know, based on how much stuff we have and the time allotted, um, how much detail we're able to go into in the descriptions. So um, that took, you know, a few revisions to really, um, be able to keep the project moving forward and get it, get that sweet spot of enough information that it's going to be useful, but still being able to get through everything. So besides the fan collection, what are some of your favorite things besides the fan collection? Well, the fan collection is definitely up there. <laughs> um, I have a new favorite object like every week, <laughs> which anyone who works over at the Gosnold Center can tell you, you know, oh, I found this new thing. It's my new favorite thing. Um, I think um, some of the earlier pieces, and actually I have to say that the quilts, because before this project, I didn't really know much about quilts. I didn't really have that much of an interest in quilts, to be honest, but um, going through them and, and learning more about them as I go and doing a lot of research, um, there's just so much that you can see in them, all the different fabrics, the different choices that the maker had to make to come up with the final product, and the fact that a lot of them are much earlier, the 18th century, it's, it's a treat just to find um, some of the earlier things that you don't get to see as often, especially that Indian palampur. So. Um, she actually didn't really realize how much costume we had, so it was sort of just um, luck that you know she came when during the year that I'm working on this project. She, I think, was looking at some of the depictions of fashion on Scrimshaw as well. So she was doing some sort of peripheral research to what she was focusing on, and then um, I was able to show her a lot of stuff that she wasn't really expecting to see because I had recently been cataloging the bodices that had the baleen in them. So, so hopefully people will be finding those online in the future now that they, they're more available than, than they've ever been before. Wonderful. Um, so we're going to wrap things up. Let's have another big round of applause for Jennifer. Thank you so much. Um, and like I said, today is our last Food for Thought. Um, we have one more program coming up in December. Um, it's our Night of Holiday Magic. So if you have any kids, um, please bring them back. It'll be December 9th. Thank you all for coming out today. <laughs>